It's time to move on to our keynote speaker. Welcome, Karen. Uh, and my, I've got to sort of juggle two screens here to do Karen's introduction. Uh, we had a little bit of a shakeup. We initially had a talk on Alewives scheduled for this meeting. And after some discussion, we decided it was too soon to jump into Alewives and they're complicated and, um, there's except, except <laughs> Susan, I'm going to interrupt because I decided perhaps we should. Oh, okay. So, well, but carry on. <laughs> okay. Well, here's my pitch for Karen. We switched gears and went with Karen because I, we are, we wanted to uh, take a little bit bigger perspective on it, and uh, because of the complexity of it, so we are not shy about talking about ale wives. We we want to talk about them, and we we uh, want to learn more about them. And so um, that's why Karen's here is to give us a big picture and dive in to a little bit about ale wives, um, but setting the stage for that understanding. So uh, Karen is. <laughs> A research, hopefully you saw her bio if you joined the webinar early, her bio um, was in the introductory loop, but I'll just do a quick one because I don't want to waste anyone's time. I mean, I don't want to, not waste, I don't want to take any more time than um, and we want to spend our time listening to Karen. But Karen has a PhD in limnology zoology from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, or she worked on invasive crayfish on lake communities. And then, and then she, um, since then, she has taught at small college and large college colleges, and now she's at USM, where she is in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy, I believe. And uh, she works, teaches lots of great classes there. She leads undergraduates and master's students in research. And I think what's really exciting is some of her work right now on with local, some of you folks out there, Lake Association, she's been working with Highland Lake Association. She is working on a large NSF funded project on the future of dams. She is, and for that group, she's the river herring expert. So she's a great person to, um, and as a professor, I think every time I talk to Karen, if I think of a question, she's talking to me and telling me something and I'm thinking, oh, I wonder, I have a question and she always anticipates and answers the question. So <laughs> she's a great person to have here because hopefully that happens for all of you. Um, but also, if you have questions as Karen uh, gives her presentation, please just enter them. It's helpful if you use the Q&A box and then they won't get lost in the chat. I'll moderate those questions and we'll get them to Karen at the end of the talk. And without any further ado, thank you so much, Karen, for agreeing to talk. And um, I'll turn off my video and it's all yours. Great. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, Let's, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. So I, I, um, I'm gonna throw Susan a little bit of a, a softball here. Uh, and, and as I was working on my talk last night, um, I decided, you know, let, let's talk about alewives. Um, and so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna dive in to alewives um, and talk a little bit about interactions with alewives and lake systems. So as Susan said, uh, my background is in limnology where I looked at uh, the impacts of an invasive crayfish on lake ecosystems. And when I moved to Maine, um, alewife um, proved to be a really interesting organism to work on because uh, they are present in lakes, they are present in rivers, and they're present in the ocean. And here in Maine, um, somewhat uniquely, we have many, many systems in which alewives can move from the ocean to, to lakes. But these things are complex. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this. So the question really, whoops, sorry, let me get my, my uh, controls working here. The question really is, why is it that the reintroduction of these native sea run fish is sometimes so controversial in Maine? Um, and so I wanted to talk about how these fish interact with lakes and um, really just open the conversation. Um, What's interesting is that these fish have been present in Maine for hundreds of years in our records, right? But thousands of years prior to that, they were probably some of the first colonizing fishes after glaciation 15,000 years ago um, because they were coming from the ocean. Um, 
And we also have, uh, so we have many lakes in Maine that have had alewives um, indefinitely, and many lakes that have relatively new reintroductions with no obvious negative consequences in most cases. And so the question is, why is it that, that the reintroduction of these fishes can be so controversial? Um, unfortunately, I think the answer is sort of unsatisfying at this point. Um, and I'm going to walk through why I think the answer is unsatisfying. Um, and the unsatisfying question is, it's complicated. Um, and so let's talk about a few of those things. One of the issues that we have is that lake systems are not necessarily responding to alewife in a similar way, which often ends up giving us conflicting information, which is really difficult to deal with, especially in this sort of environment that we are in today where people really want to know, is it a yes or is it a no? And that's very difficult um, to arrive at that type of an answer for these complex systems. And you all know that all lakes are not the same. Um, each lake is sitting within a watershed that has um, differences in terms of the amount of nutrients that are moving into the lake, different types of land uses. Some may be urban watersheds, some may be suburban, some may be extraordinarily rural with very little human impact on the watershed at all. We also have lakes across a wide range of sizes, we have lakes in Maine across a wide range of trophic status or productivity. And what I mean by that is how much nutrients are in the lake, um, how much algae is, can grow in that lake, um, what are the fish populations, how many fish are in those lakes, and so on. And then also we have different compositions of resident fish populations too that might interact in different ways with alewives. Um, and so uh, because of these disparities in lake types, um, there's often not one answer to the question of how alewives interact in lakes. Another really important thing um, to realize is that not all alewives are the same. So if you were to do a Google search for alewife and lake, many of the uh, papers and news reports that, and, and even um, invasive species fact sheets, in fact, um, that you might get in your Google search will be about introduced landlocked populations. So these are populations that do not return to the ocean as adults, and they're present in the lakes all year round. And so their impact on those lakes is very different than, as we'll talk about, a sea run alewife, which is in the lake from anywhere from a month to four months or five months, depending upon circumstances in that lake. And so if you do this Google search, you'll find that in fact, landlocked alewives can have really large measurable impacts on lake ecosystems. Um, and the prime example, of course, is the Great Lakes, uh, where the Great Lakes were invaded by alewives through several different canals. Um, once they reached the Great Lakes, they um, habituated, they adapted to the uh, freshwater conditions um, and now reproduce in the Great Lakes. But they're very different fish. They're only about five inches long as an adult. Um, and again, they're there year round. And so it's really important when you're looking for information about how alewives impact the lakes, the very first thing you need to determine is, is it a landlocked population that the study is describing? and um, or is it a native sea run population? Okay, so before we dive into how alewives impact lakes, let's just spend a little time introducing you to an alewife because many of you are probably from lakes that don't have alewife runs and you may have never seen um, an alewife. So this on your screen is an adult alewife. Um, these fish uh, as adults are from 9 to 12 inch, inches in length, so they're quite large, in fact, um, or can be quite large for these older fishes. They're distinguished by that big eye and the black dot behind the operculum of the fish um, over here. They're quite deep bodied from top to bottom, and if you look at them head on, they're very skinny side to side. Um, and in fact, they have this very sharp point along their bottom um, sort of ridge line along their belly. Um, and so uh, in some places of the world, they're actually known as saw bellies because the scales come together in a point and are quite rough along that point. This is a fish that is built for swimming. 
This is what it does best. Um, in fact, if you capture these fish and um, want to put them in an aquarium, um, an older fish has to be in a round aquarium because they swim constantly um, and they school constantly. Um, and so if you put them in an aquarium with square sides, they bump their head um, and it's pretty detrimental to them, which is kind of interesting. They're also extraordinarily stiff fish. So you pick it up, they're kind of flat like a board. This is a group of fish that are moving up mill stream off the Presumpscot River down here in, in Portland, um, moving up to spawn. So I mentioned that there are introduced and native populations. This is a map uh, maintained by the USGS that uh, maps out points where invasive inter introduced landlocked populations have been found. And really, in fact, they're throughout the Great Lakes. Um, but there's also many lakes inland where either they've arrived on their own, in some cases, when you're closer to the Great Lakes, or where they were stocked um, as, as a forage fish, potentially. But the other thing I want you to notice is that the native range of sea white run alewife extends quite far inland um, because they run up rivers to spawn. Um, and you can see in Maine that this is a good portion potentially of Maine. And in fact, um, alewives also are in other parts of Nova Scotia as well. Um, what this map doesn't show you is its sea distribution. So our alewives that leave our lakes in Maine um, spend their adulthood swimming around the Gulf of Maine and sometimes even stray further south. They go up into the Bay of Fundy um, and, and are quite abundant. This is based on research trawls working in the Gulf of Maine. We also know that the small little alewives that are maybe one year old or two year old tend to stick close to our coast. And so those fish are very much an inshore marine fish found in bays um, and around the islands. Um, and so they're, uh, uh, they really are an important part of the marine ecosystem potentially as well, even though this map only shows them distributed in fresh water. Alewives have a pretty interesting life history. Um, it's similar to a Pacific salmon, but not in one very important aspect. So alewives as adults and older juveniles spend their time at sea and an important and very key characteristic of an alewife is that it homes to its natal lake, much like Pacific salmon home to their natal rivers um, and streams or lakes in some cases. Um, and so if you have an ale run in your lake, an alewife run in your lake, and that fish was born there, you can expect to see it returning if all goes well while it's out in the ocean to that very same lake um, essentially five years later. Um, and so when the adults move up rivers to spawn, they move into lakes, they spawn. And then after a month or two, assuming they have good access out of the lake, they will leave and head back out to sea. We know that some proportion are consumed when they're in the lake or perhaps die. Um, and so those actually represent an input potentially of marine derived nutrients. And this is one thing that people can be concerned about. But at the same time, many of the adults leave. And this is very different than Pacific salmon. Pacific salmon, for the most part, die once they spawn. That is not true uh, with alewives. So they head back out to sea. A lucky alewife that's not harvested or eaten by a marine predator or eaten on its way back down the river um, can return to spawn um, multiple times. Um, and so in a very healthy population, you may have fish that have spawned four or five years in a row. The young of year then spend the summer in the lake. Um, they grow very rapidly. Um, and then in the fall, or actually starting as early in, as July, start moving out towards the estuaries and our bays. Some of these fish um, in some systems literally go from a freshwater lake, plop right into the ocean. Um, which is quite remarkable, really, because if you know anything about fish physiology, the ability to move from freshwater to saltwater is limited to a very few fish species. Um, and you can take a juvenile alewife and take it from um, uh, completely freshwater and put it into Penobscot Bay, and it will survive, which is really quite a remarkable characteristic. Anyway, these juveniles um, spend time along the coast and then move out into the Gulf of Maine before returning to spawn. 
The issue, of course, is that historically, these fish moved well into uh, the state of Maine, up many, many different rivers, and infiltrated quite deeply into, um, into the state. I don't want you to take this historic distribution as, as um, absolute gospel. Uh, there's disagreement in some cases about what lakes these fish did or did not get to, but we do know that they moved quite a ways into, into the state. But their distribution today, and this is not controversial or, or um, uh, of, there's no disagreement about this, um, their distribution today is very limited relative to their historic distribution. And this is primarily and almost entirely due to the presence of dams on rivers and at lake outlets. Okay. The reason why we're seeing a push in the state to restore alewives to their native spawning habitat is in response to a precipitous decline in throughout their entire range down south all the way up into Nova Scotia. And this precipitous decline is in many cases related to very heavy harvesting that occurred in these fishes by, or on these fishes, I guess in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s offshore where fisheries impacted both juveniles and adults and at very high numbers. And the fisheries never really recovered such that um, by about 2007, 2008, most alewife fisheries were closed um, up and down the seaboard, except for Maine, where we've managed to maintain a modicum of harvest. Um, these fish were harvested for food, at one point, um, they're now harvested as a source of local high quality um, lobster bait. And can be really important for the towns in Maine that harvest alewives where they might represent sometimes $30,000 worth of revenue for these towns. Um, and luckily these fish respond fairly well to restoration. So what I'm showing you here is work that's been done in the Penobscot watershed uh, where you may be aware of several dam removals and so on and so forth. Um, and so uh, the important thing to know here is that the bars represent the number of adults that were put into lakes. You'll notice like in Pushaw Lake that they're only stocked for four years and the results are quite remarkable. So in addition to dam removals and so on, stocking was occurring. And these are the results and the number of adults coming back. So the Penobscot system went from about um, 9,000 fish in 2011 to well over 2 million fish coming back in more recent years. And this is quite a remarkable recovery. It is really important, however, to note that this is only, even at the highest years, only about 19% of very conservative estimates of historic numbers of fish. Um, and that's because there's still a lack of access to, to lots and lots of historic spawning habitat. Okay, now um, let's talk a little bit about how these alewife um, interact with lakes. And um, Susan, can you interrupt me if we're reaching a time where you'd like me to stop talking? <laughs> um, just let me know. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, so um, alewife have numerous ways that they might insert themselves into the um, ecosystem of a lake. Um, they're coming in as potential prey for bass and loons and other predators. They consume zooplankton. They may be competitors with other fish for that zooplankton prey. And they may also serve as vectors, importantly, both for marine derived nutrients coming into the lake and freshwater derived nutrients when they leave. You can think of these fish as little packets of nutrients, if you wish, um, and so that, are, that move. <laughs> so they bring in marine nutrients and the juveniles and sometimes the adults leave taking with them freshwater nutrients. And so this is just a simple food web um, showing uh, interactions of our limiting nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen. Phosphorus and nitrogen are used by algae to grow. Um, algae are consumed by herbivorous zooplankton like this large Daphnia or small um, Bosmina um, and copepods. And juvenile alewife feed quite heavily on zooplankton. And they themselves, of course, are prey for many other fish. And I've thrown here in here too potential competition with fish like rainbow smelt and white perch that are also uh, large consumers of, of um, zooplankton. But also I could also put in all other larval fish because almost all uh, fish when they're very small eat zooplankton. 
So what evidence do we have from Maine Lakes about how these fish interact? My objective here is to show some results and really just open up the conversation so we can talk, uh, learn more about alewife, how they might change a lake and, and concerns you might have. So this is not an extensive comprehensive literature review. I haven't dealt with studies that are from lakes further south than Maine because these lakes are often um, situated in more developed watersheds, so comparisons are, are far more nu nuanced, excuse me, and I haven't talked about studies from landlocked populations of alewives. Both of these types of studies can really um, inform some of our questions or at least drive some hypotheses as to what we might to expect, um, so they're not to be ignored at all, um, but I'm not going to talk about these studies. In fact, I'm just going to talk about a few. So one thing is to look at how much zooplankton are consumed by alewives. This is actually um, a paper by Demi et al. in 2015 where they looked at body length and they found that in lakes that did not have alewives, the length of those Daphne I showed you in the previous slide stayed about the same throughout the year but decreased in lakes that had alewives because alewives were eating those large Daphnia. Same for the copepods, um, stayed about the same but in lakes with alewife they decreased in size. And this is something that I've seen in lakes like Damariscotta um, and Highland Lake and other lakes that I've worked on well. This is a pretty common response. But they found a pretty, an inconsistent effect on zooplankton biomass. Um, so again, adding complication. So one of the questions might be then, do changes in zooplankton communities or increases or changes in nutrients affect algal abundance? Because of course, this is the measure that people as lake users are seeing, what you see is how green is your lake or how deep can you see it into the water. And so this is the response that most of us um, sort of think of when we're thinking of impacts from or potential impacts from alewives. So um, I'm going to borrow a couple of slides from Barry Maurer who uh, looked at secchi disk transparency, in particular minimum secchi disk transparency, annual minimum secchi disk transparency over time versus the number of alewives in a lake. Unfortunately, there's not that many lakes in Maine that we have both of these sets of data for because many lakes, we don't know the number of adults that have moved into the lake. And we also don't know the density of juveniles in those lakes either. Um, and so what you find is in lakes that are stocked, usually at six fish per acre is what this number is representing. Um, you really often don't see much in the change in secchi disk transparency. But in many of these lakes, um, we also have simultaneous efforts to reduce erosion, reduce other sources of phosphorus into the lake. So things are happening all at the same time in these lakes, and each lake, of course, is different. We can also look at more realistic adult numbers. This is for Weber Pond that goes through the period of time that includes when the fish were being stocked and then when you start to see this almost exponential increase in adults until they start to reach kind of what we think is the carrying capacity often of these ponds. And in Weber Pond, um, they've actually seen a bit of an increase um, in secchi disk depth, so better lake transparency. But again, lots of stuff going on in the watershed trying to improve water transparency in this lake um, and reduce by reducing phosphorus. So two things again, simultaneously going on. Here's another lake. This is, uh, and oh, I should point out too that um, here we're looking at 300 adults per acre in this lake, much, much higher densities than those stocking densities. And here's more realistic adult numbers. This is Sewell Pond. Um, <clears throat> showing, uh, again, in Sewell Pond, interestingly enough, an increase in um, minimum secchi disk transparency over time. And again, these data only go to 2018, so um, <clears throat> they could be, uh, who knows what's happened the last few years. Finally, um, oh, and one last run. Um, this is Damariscotta Lake, and I put Damariscotta Lake in here because these data go all the way back to 1987. And this is one of the few lakes where we actually have a full count of the number of adults that enter the lake um, and that also are returning um, to spawn in total. Um, and this is also the run that has been managed since about 1804, uh, or that we have records of management since 1804. So it's a very old run. Um, and so uh, 
Damascata Lake, again, has shown through various different abundances of adult alewives, um, somewhat steady with fluctuations of this minimum secchi disc transparency. Although this past year, there was a algal bloom that occurred in late August in one of the basins of the lake. So again, things are moving around. Finally, um, Highland Lake and Wyndham. This is the lake that I've spent the most time on. Um, um, this is the lake that triggered a lot of concern about um, potential impacts of alewives on lakes because it experienced a really dramatic increase in the number of alewives in 2012 due, we think, to a big change in uh, passage in the stream that goes to the lake with changes in culverts. And so numbers shot up really high, um, and then numerous years with high numbers of alewives. And what the residents of the lake, this really fantastic water quality team um, working in Highland Lake observed was that the minimum secchi became uh, more and more minimum. <laughs> uh, in other words, and at some point in 2014, they actually started to see they had a three-year bloom, a three-year, sorry, a three-week bloom with secchi um, hovering around two meters or less which is what we would consider a nuisance algal bloom. Um, and so uh, I began working with the group in 2018, um, but of course you'll notice the minimum secchi has been sort of inching up over time. And what's not shown in this lake, in this um, diagram is that the length of time of the algal bloom has become shorter and shorter from three weeks now down to maybe a week or even just a few days that are noticeable to people living around the lake. So some interesting, interesting things going on in that lake, including in some cases an increase in the maximum secchi, which seems to be associated with a clear water phase now that is occurring in the spring, which the lake didn't seem to have in the past. Um, and again, that may be associated with alewives in the lake. I don't have the most recent data here. Not sure what happened in 2020, um, although I do know that there was not an extensive bloom in 2020. Um, I also want to uh, do a shout out to the Highland Lake Association here because they've been tremendous partners on this effort. Um, it's been a real pleasure um, working with that group on these questions. Finally, I just wanted to address competition in Sea run alewife lakes. These are uh, some juvenile alewives. You can see they're just an inch or two long um, from Highland Lake. Um, there's been a couple of studies in Maine that have some relevance to competition between sea run alewives and other fish in lakes. The, the what is known as the Lake George study found that there were lower numbers of young of year rainbow smelt during three years of alewife stocking. Um, these alewives were stocked at pretty low numbers, six adults per acre, um, but they weren't able to determine what caused the low numbers of young of year because they were trawling for smelt and captured a lot of smelt. And so they weren't sure if they had caused the reduction either, but they did find that uh, the rena remaining smelt were well-fed and growing well. Um, Maureen and Mink in 2002 compared the diets of adult white perch in Lake George, that at that time did not have alewives, and two lakes that did have alewives. And what they found is that adult white perch shifted to eating fish earlier in the summer and consumed almost exclusively young of year alewife. What they didn't look at is whether juvenile or larval white perch were consuming the same thing as juvenile alewives and whether there was potential for competition there. Finally, an interesting study that came out of Nova Scotia where Hansen and Curry found significant consumption of young of year alewife by young of year smallmouth bass when a sides range of adult alewives were available. So this was in a lake where um, alewives had free access to the lake and spawning occurred over several weeks to a month and a half or so. Um, but they also compared this to a reservoir where adult alewives were only allowed to enter the lake for a three week period. So the, the spawning period was very uh, truncated. And as a consequence, all the alewives were exactly the same size and bass were only able to eat those alewives if they happened to be a little bit bigger. Um, and so in that case, there was more of a competition between young of year alewives um, 
and the young of your bass. And so um, some implications for how you would manage and allow alewives to enter and exit lakes. All right, so finally, I wanted to end with um, just a reminder that lake characteristics seem to be an important part of um, what, how, how these fish interact in the lake. And so, for example, nutrient status does seem to have an impact, although it's not clear how that impact might go because there may be impacts in oligotrophic lakes that are more noticeable and maybe in really eutrophic lakes like the Ken Wagner study that sort of has caused um, a bunch of brouhaha <laughs> this spring, right? Um, so the work that Ken has done is, is absolutely valid, uh, but working, but he's been working in lakes that have, uh, that are so eutrophic that they required alum treatments to reduce the amount of phosphorus in the lake and reduce the algal blooms. And what he found in his lakes is that lakes that had alewife populations tended to bloom more often or more quickly after an alum treatment. That is a very valid result, but applies to just a few lakes here in Maine at this point. Um, we also know that the effectiveness of upstream and in particular downstream passage probably has a lot of um, impact on how alewives interact with lake ecosystems, because if alewives can't get out of a lake, which is sometimes true when we have low water levels in July and August, then they're going to spend a lot more time in the lake ecosystem and, and, and eating um, and being eaten and so on. Other fish populations may cause some concern if we are um, concerned that alewives may compete with other prey, for example, uh, rainbow smelt. And again, there's actually work going on now to, to look into that issue a little bit more uh, deeply. Um, we may also be concerned about the potential for harmful algal blooms, and that might change our perspective on, on how we view these potential interactions between alewives and lake ecosystems. And then finally, I just wanted to remind everyone that things are changing pretty rapidly right now. And in fact, this year, um, at least in the marine systems, we are on track for another marine heat wave, which will probably also be reflected in our lakes this summer. Um, alewives returned, alewives respond to temperature when they come back to spawn. And in many systems, they came back over three weeks earlier than usual, uh, which is quite remarkable. Um, and so, uh, and, and we also expect that lakes will also respond to this warm spring that we've had in ways that may change these dynamics between alewives and lake ecosystems. And so this climate change has really underlined many, um, many of the management decisions we make and also um, uh, adding uncertainty to what may or may not happen. Um, okay, so in conclusion, um, interestingly enough, both water quality, and that is water, and part of that is water transparency, um, and native fish populations are required um, to be maintained by the Clean Water Act. And so um, our agencies in the state may find themselves in a bit of conflict or a bit of conundrum on um, where, where they go with this. Um, in addition, the alewife is a important marine forage fish. It's consumed by, by um, commercially important species such as cod and mackerel when it's present. So that picture in the background is the diet of this poor mackerel whose stomach I have just pumped um, and caused it to <laughs> uh, give up its meal. Um, and so what you're seeing on my sieve there is uh, actually several alewives and, and a pogey, <laughs> as it turns out. So it must have been a mixed school. Um, and interestingly enough, this is one of the only marine forage fishes that we as, as humans have direct control over its access to its native spawning grounds. Um, we can't say that for Atlantic herring, which are historically low numbers right now in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and so as a consequence, because this is a commercially fish species, um, NOAA fisheries is required by law to manage it and to maintain this species. And so you can see that we have different agencies with potentially conflicting um, uh, missions <laughs> converging around this one, this one 
unusual fish. So I hope that I've sort of given you a little bit of background about this fish and given you a little understanding of some of the concerns that managers may have about the introduction, um, some of our uncertainties and complexities that are involved with understanding how these fish um, interact with lake ecosystems. Um, and I'm hoping that you will join me in a careful consideration of both individual lake uh, characteristics and that we will find a willingness for management um, and lakeshore owners um, and those of us who use lakes to, first of all, do some great monitoring so we understand what's going on in these lakes, to adapt to new information as studies comes out and we are gathering this body of evidence, um, perhaps to do a little compromise, um, and, then, and then perhaps to, uh, to be prepared for a little change, both from Analyze, but also uh, I think climate change is going to change many of these uh, potential interactions. So with that, I will, I will open up uh, for, for questions and um, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. You did throw a curveball in there, but <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job of an objective presentation. And so hopefully, um, you know, hopefully that's that that's that's been helpful to everyone. Um, you did anticipate my question, of course, which was you know, I was going to ask about climate change. Um, and I, I think that you put it really well that the uncertainty around climate change is really critical. Uh, I have a couple of questions that have come in. One, this one I think is just, speaks directly to that individual lake situation. Um, among, here's a question. Among other hurdles to alewife introduction, our lake outflow stops in July. If ales can, alewives can't leave, it seems introducing, reintroducing alewives would increase our problematic phosphorus. Also our lake, this lake was treated with alum in reference to the, what you mentioned with the Wagner study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so so this is, it is um there are many lakes in Maine where alewives can't leave in July and August. Um, this is not an unusual uh, situation. It's probably going to become more common uh, than it used to be because of uh, our, our sort of summer droughts that we're starting to develop in July and August. That's becoming more and more common. Um, and so, yes, you may end up with a situation where fish have a longer period of time to interact with those lake ecosystems. Um, I think my advice is, uh, in this case, and this is where managers have some compromise and some deep discussions to make about how, how in a lake like that, that because of its individual lake characteristics, because it had an alum treatment, because it has had a history of high phosphorus levels, how do you, how would you reintroduce a native species under those circumstances in a way that's managed? Um, and so I am seeing um, from our state agencies a slow, um, maybe acknowledgement that um, that reintroduction of these species needs to be a, a more measured process and a process that is carefully um, monitored. Um, and so uh, it might be that there are certain lakes where as a collective group, the decision is made that either it's too risky or there's other lakes that would be less risky and just as productive. So, I think that um, what I'm encouraging people to do who may live on a lake like that is to be really engaged in this conversation and ask good, tough questions of agencies. Um, go to public meetings and try to learn as much as you can. And then also join your lake association water monitoring group and get out there and, and really learn about how your lake responds to all, all sorts of impacts. Um, I'm not gonna say, no, alewives shouldn't go into that lake. But I do think that based on what we know, we should proceed with caution. Absolutely. It's a good question. Right. Uh, so 
so one quick thing, a couple of people have asked about uh, water, lake water monitoring and Secchi disk. Um, Peter Keller made a comment to remember that looking at fluctuations in Secchi depth, that Secchi depth is related to precipitation fluctuations. Absolutely. So we just want to make that comment. And then for anyone wanting to know more about lake monitoring and Secchi depth in those lake uh, water quality teams that Karen just mentioned, Lake Stewards of Maine is really the go-to or they're the ones who um, organize that program and train volunteers. So it's, I believe it's lakestewardsofmaine.org. Um, and we can share that um, link with an e a post webinar email uh, message, but uh, that's where to go for more information. They've got tons of great resources. And, you know, if we can get some new lakes, lake monitoring teams out of this talk, then we have, we've, we've, we've won and we've made progress. That's a win. <laughs> Absolutely. So, another question. Um, uh, what about what about a decision making process for lake communities in determining how to assess the advantages disadvantages of alewife migration? What are the key factors? Uh, key factors identify. Sorry, this I'm not. I can't really reword it on the fly. Key factors identified according to the unique characteristics of an individual lake. So yeah. So if you're going to make a decision or you want more information. What would be some key things? Obviously, Secchi transparency, Secchi depth info, if you have it, other water chemistry things you should be looking at. Well, I think that things will that will be taken into a consideration will be things like total phosphorus levels, um, Secchi history in the lake um, in terms of of nutrients. Um, uh, sometimes, lake uh, sort of resident fish populations may be part of that equation. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Um, you know, in the future, we may be also considering how we expect that lake potentially to respond to longer, warmer summers, for example, too. Um, but all of those parts that I talked about may become part of the equation. I think What's maybe important to comment on here is that we're still not at a point where we have sort of a predictive model of what will happen. We can only hypothesize what we think will happen based on what we know about a given lake. Um, because of, this, the, of these complex systems and because of all these interactions that are going on, um, I'm not sure though that we will ever have every single answer needed, right? It's, it's rarely that way. And there's the problem, of course, is we're faced with a situation where this is a, fi a native fish whose numbers are not necessarily recovering and it needs, we can't wait, <laughs> you know, 20 years to get every possible piece of information about this native fish and its interaction with the lakes, um, else we'll lose the fish, um, for example. And, and I should say that these fish um, have been described to me by other fish biologists as they were probably the king salmon of the East Coast. They would have come back in far greater numbers than our, our native salmon. So in many cases, we don't even realize what we've lost with the absence of these fish in these lakes. But that said, um, there's, there'll be, there will be a lot to consider. Um, but again, I don't think we can make cut and dry predictions about what may or may not happen. We can only look at what we've seen so far. I know that's not a good, that's a really unsatisfying answer, yeah, isn't it? Well, I mean, that's the status. That's why we're in this dilemma is that we need more information and there's no clear cut. ABC is one, you know, it's not one it's way. Not, and exactly. Yeah. yeah. A uh, couple more questions. I'll just make a comment. If, if anyone hasn't seen an alewife run, I highly recommend getting to one, if you, especially if you're in our neck of the woods along the coast. And I think, I mean, Dammer Scott and Mills is a great one. And uh, what's always amazing to me, having worked on the Loon Project for 20 years before coming to Maine Lakes, is the number of loons and cormorants and mergansers that hang out when those alewives come into the lake. And that's one thing that's always intrigued me is what's the ecological value for our fish eating birds? Um, Cause they sort of get lost in the equation. I mean, they're just not really considered. And I wonder what the carrying capacity of loons is relative to alewives. Cause that's a great uh, source of food for uh, loons is particularly in the spring when they're hungry and they're about to nest and they're looking for food. So 
definitely go if you want to see loons, you want to see a feast, uh, uh, a bunch of birds feasting on AOS, go to the top of the Dammer Scott Mills fish ladder in right around Mother's Day or maybe April uh, in this year. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so two more questions. Uh, uh, this is from Peter Callen. I live on, and I'm including his name because he's making an offer here that you might be interested in. Uh, I live on a lake heavily populated with landlocked alewives, long mm. pond in the Belgrades. We have lost our smelt population and landlocked salmon now grow huge. And now in landlocked salmon, we now grow huge fat smallmouth bass, northern pike, brown trout, and loons. Is anyone in Maine thinking about studying landlocked alewives? And because he would be happy to help. So. <laughs> that's a that's a really uh, good question. So so you're also pointing out that there we do have populations of landlocked um, alewife. In some cases, thought they may have landlocked themselves, and in other cases, they were introduced as a forage fish. Um, and sometimes we don't know. Um, there's not a lot of populations along land, land of landlocked um, alewives, but there are some. Um, uh, uh, we're beginning, uh, we being uh, the main state agencies are beginning a joint project looking at impact on smelt, but I think they're focusing mostly on, um, on the sea run alewives. Um, of course the question, uh, so, so it, it sounds like what you had in your lake was a competition between smelt and, and alewives potentially, but hard to reconstruct unless Inland Fish and Wildlife has been doing sampling there. It's really hard to reconstruct what happened and how you got there. Um, so I don't think that there's anyone actively working on interactions between landlocked alewives and in resident fish species right now, to my knowledge. Okay. Well, if, if anyone is, they should call Pete. Okay, good. All right. Uh, I should mention, and then we'll take one more question. I think we're, we're well within our time, so uh, this has gone well. Any last minute questions pop them up? Um, one thing I did want to share that I just got heard about last a couple of days ago was that that our three agencies who manage alewives, uh, who all have a role in managing alewives, DEP, Department of Marine, so Envi Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Marine Resources, Department of uh, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, have actually come together with a memo for the first time with sort of a joint statement about. Um, Alewives and Alewives management and a commitment to work together and really figure this out. They have been, they have been in silos and sort of each doing their own thing. So it was just a great letter to read and I'm happy to share that with anybody who wants it. It's really, I think a really promise, it's really promising institutions or agencies are so important to this question and it's just great to see them working together on this. Um, I mean, I think they've always worked together in some level, but this really is, to me, brings it to a new level of, um, of cooperation. So that is great. I have, one, I have one more question, and I think this is probably going to be, you're going to come back with a similar answer to the one um, we had earlier, but how can the number numbers of alewives be managed to minimize potential impact to a lake and maximize any benefits? Yeah, um, I think people have some good ideas about how that might be possible. Um, so one would be to maximize their ability to leave. Um, another may be to establish, uh, to harvest adults coming in so that you have um, perhaps not as many adults reaching the lake. Um, uh, that has not been put into practice as a lake management tool per se, um, be, although we do have harvests around the state, but those harvests are trying to maximize the number of fish that are harvested for the, pur for the, for the purposes of harvesting. <laughs> um, uh, and so, uh, so making sure fish get out, potentially um, managing the number of fish that are coming in. Um, and again, that has not been done for the purposes of lake water quality up until this point. But again, I think that's where we're getting into this idea of potential compromise. Um, uh, so those are probably the two big ones. Right. 
Well, thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with us by Zoom, Karen. And, uh, you know, maybe next year, well, I, I gave this to Dick, but I'm going to mention it. I, he was going to mention it, but I'll mention it because I want to just enthusiastically invite people to our in-person conference in 2022. We don't know where it'll be, but it will be June 18th, 2022. Perhaps we'll have an alewife panel. Maybe, maybe we'll have, maybe we can get an update um, then on what's happened in the last year. Who knows? But I am so excited to see all of you. I love looking at the names of the attendees and seeing familiar faces and people I know and people I would very much like to see in, in person. So um, maybe you can come back next year, Karen. Thank you so much for your talk. I think all of us learned a lot. So thank you uh, from all of Maine Lakes members and board. Thanks for giving our keynote presentation. Great. This was wonderful. And, uh, and I would love to meet you all in person. So fingers crossed for next year. All Thank right. You. Thank you all. That's a great idea to, to have a panel discussion uh, as well. Uh, Dr. Wilson, thank you very much. That was a great informative presentation. And I'm sure it's going to start in some of our minds, the, uh, the questions that are going to come to resolution in the next few years. So thank you. Thank you also to Yvonne Davis, who left our board uh, this year. She served on the Education Committee and will be missed by the board. As uh, Susan mentioned, the next meeting will be in person. We are expecting and hoping for. Um, and uh, Peter Cowan just said June 18th is National Go Fishing Day. So <laughs> that's going to be interesting. Peter may not be with us, or he'll be uh, Wi-Fi connected from his boat. Or we have that as part of our conference and people actually go fishing during the conference. Oh, that would be exactly right. Maybe. Thank you very much, everyone, for being with us today and supporting uh, Healthy Maine Lakes. Um, are there any further business or discussion points that anyone wants to raise? Drew, do you see any hands being raised or comments? Um, I'll take over for Drew. I do not. So, okay. No more comments. So, so there being no further business, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much again. Thanks, everybody.